to say this, you clearly see here the distinction, distinction in this passage of Scripture of what not to do and what to do. Don't show partiality in the first part of the text. The last part of the text is how to live. Live mercifully. Live without partiality and judgment. So how to live, how the world sees things really in the first part of the verse and how the world makes ju judgment and how the flesh makes judgment and then you see the heirs of the kingdom, my brethren. This is the way that we're behaved while we're here on earth. Now let me tell you something about it. The church is intended to live in unity. Let me say that again. The church is intended to be in unity. How can any house stand unless it's in unity? No house can stand if it's divided, the Bible says. Unity is our goal at the church and unity glorifies God. Now, what's the problem? That's the intent. But how many times at church do you see jealousy? Do you see envy? Why? Because there's a lack of self-control in the individual's lives. Why is it that you have to practice church discipline publicly? Because it starts personally. And the Holy Spirit in His ministry works in the life of the believer to suppress or rid the sin and lead that believer in the way that honors and glorifies the Lord with the way that behave. That starts with individual. That starts with an individual in his life being full of the Spirit and the Spirit working in and through his life. Preacher, why are you talking about this? Because if you have partiality in the church, it starts with individuals in the church. If you have favoritism or if you have preferring the rich above the poor, here like we see in this passage of Scripture, it's because of the individuals inside a local body. It's specific. And that is the case with all sin. If you have adultery going on in a church, you have to deal with it publicly, but it first starts privately. All sin is an individual private matter. And it starts with a lack of self control a, a lack of self-discipline spiritually and that's what i hope revival brings to us here is an increase in self-discipline self-control that is the fruit of the spirit that you're controlling yourself and suppressing unrighteousness in our life let me just give you an example real quick of what partiality does in individuals do you remember the old testament story in the old testament man named joseph his whole story starts out with how his father Jacob loved him more than he loved his other children. And uh, he had favorites. And uh, what did that do to Joseph's brothers? Watch this. It, watch what jealousy does in the months of... I don't care who it is. It leads people to unreasonable behavior. Why? Why? I don't know. That's just what it does. The effect of sin. It led Joseph's brother to come up with a horrible, horrific plan in their life. Now, what's the result of unreasonable behavior? Joseph's brothers had to live their whole life guilty. With a guilty conscience. Because of the unreasonable behavior that jealousy produced in their life. Now, how many of us know that jealousy is like a stinking disease? You want to kill a group of people? You want to kill people? In, 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 I'm talking about in a spiritual sense. Inside the church, you want to suppress the Spirit of God? You want to suppress God's work in your life? You let it get a little jealousy and a little envy going on inside a body of believers. That will cure the power of God in a church like that. But where does it start? Individuals. And what happens is when jealousy happens, it, it causes to lead them to unruly behavior. Now watch this. Watch this, church. Most of the time, when people see something that they think they might know what's going on. And it leads them to jealousy and envy. What that produces is obviously 
behavior that is unreasonable. But oftentimes, it's based off assumptions, not truth. It truly is. It's based off assumptions. And most of the time, the assumptions are not true. And people get so worked up and, and, and so divided and Satan is just at work when you start assuming things that you don't know. People make decisions based off emotions not filtered to the truth of what's going on. But what I'm saying, do you remember Rachel and Leah in that story? Who was their husband? Jacob? So Jacob loved Rachel. But Leah could have children. Rachel wanted children and didn't care if Jacob loved her or not. But Leah desperately wanted Jacob to love her. And you know what that caused between the two women? Resentment. Envy. Strife. You tell me what the result of partiality is. Look what it does in Joseph's life. To his family. Where it leads them to. Church, don't think you and I are above it. Don't think this place is above it. You want to take this church down the wrong road? You and I as individuals get jealous and let envy and strife in this place. You know what we'll do? We'll kick the Holy Spirit out the door and this place will go to crumbles. And that's a nice way of saying it. But what we're going to have to practice is self-discipline. Self-control of these things. Now, how is it do we handle it? Do we not have the Word of God to tell us how to handle each situation? You want to ruin this place? Handle it apart from this book. You want to grow this place? Handle every situation that we go through in, in, this, uh, in this building, in this body, filtered through the Word of God. For therein we'll have success. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. And then thou shalt, have, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Amen. James chapter 2. That was the introduction. <clears throat> James chapter 2. I simply, you know the Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. How many of us think of partiality as a sin? We, we might say, well, partiality is bad, but I mean, it ain't like committing adultery. I mean, partiality is bad or, 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 or you know, preferring uh, one over the other is, I mean, that's just normal, right? And wait just a second, you ready for this one? It ain't just for the pastor. The pastor's in the spotlight. Everybody sees what the pastor does. This is for you. This is for you. This is for me as individuals. I'm talking about partiality. In each individual's life in the church. Think of this. Here's what, when I studied this, I started examining myself. And that's a good thing to do. The Word of God reads you like a book, bucko. And it reads me like a book, too. <clears throat> and I started reading this. And here's what I started thinking. Who have I had over my house? Who have I invited? Who have I spent time with? Why not you ask yourself the same question? In this local body. Who have you invested in? It's not just my job. I told Roby the other day, if I ever leave this place, which I'm not planning on it, don't want to. God, if God ever calls me somewhere else, and he might, what y'all going to do as a body of believers? You have got to invest in one another. It, I, know, I know this right here. I know that me and Dustin is, is closer to age than me and Ronnie. Is that a true? And I know Josh and Katie and I, they have kids, or Joe, they're close to our age, so we're kind of going to the same, similar times in our life. It's more apt for me to hang out with somebody my age, and it's more apt for you to hang out with somebody your age. Is that not just right? But we have to filter through this as a church and make sure that partiality is not involved in this environment. So if there is someone that you have not ministered to, or prefer over another one. Maybe it's the church's job as individuals. I can't do it all. Amen. The church's job. Interact. Interact. If, if, if there's someone that you don't hang out with. Or someone that you don't talk to on a regular basis. Go outside of your ways. You know something that I find in churches? Clicks. 
And, you know, I almost gotten to the point to where that's just the way that it is. You go to church here and you go to church there. I've been to all kinds of different churches. And let me tell you what there are. There are cliques. Does it need to be that way? Is that necessary? First, is that healthy and is that godly? I believe that this passage of Scripture truly is talking about preferring the rich over the poor. But favoritism or partiality is definitely inside this, uh, in this text. Respect of person. So let's get started. The caution. <clears throat> the caution. First, first, let us notice the audience that um, James the Apostle was talking to. And again, I, I want us to understand that this is going on. Not just in our church. This is going on here in the text. I'll have, try to help prove that to you. The audience, my brethren. My brethren is other believers with like faith in Jesus Christ. If you have like faith in Jesus Christ, will you say amen tonight? Amen. James is talking to you. <clears throat> He's talking to a local assembly. Watch this. Verse 2 says, For if there come into your what? Now you notice where it says your assembly. Not the ones that sit at home. Am I being sarcastic? No, I'm being dogmatic. Your assembly. You need an assembly. You need a local church. That's not confusing. That's not talking about the universal church. That's talking about your local church. People want to, man, it just drives me nuts, church, to listen to people and their crazy understanding of, of church. They have no eschatological view at all. Ecclesiastical, excuse me. They have no ecclesiastical view. It's in the dirt. The church is full of a bunch of hypocrites and they know more than they're supposed to know so they're just going to do without the church. Let me tell you something. We better start looking at the Word of God as our guide rather than our footstool. Amen. <clears throat> The audience, my brethren, this is a local assembly. Now, in this text, watch this. This is pretty cool. And if you're a Bible student, you want to hear this. And if you're not, you need to become one. Amen? Um, the local assembly here could be, and Daddy, I was talking about, thinking about this in the book of Hebrews. See, there was a time when the Jewish synagogue was still used as the church. Did y'all know that? And there, there come a time in history when the synagogue was a place to where Jews come in and Christians come in. So when the epistles were written, they could have implied inside of that epistle that you have unbelieving Jews and Christians assembling together. This could be that Jewish synagogue. You read the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, like 25, 26, 27. That makes perfect sense. Because in Hebrews and in James, you, you see people that, man, is he talking about brothers in Christ? Or is he talking about unbelievers? You almost get that hint in the book of James, and also you almost get that hint in the book of Hebrews. So possibly they could be talking to some that are believers and some are unbelievers here. And hey guys, we, we got to assume that when we read this, and we got to assume when we preach and proclaim the word, not everybody that's sitting under the preaching of the word of God, not everybody's saved. In his day and ours. So we see the audience and the brethren in a local assembly. We see the command. Uh, the command is clear. Uh, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. If you want to bring a reproach onto the glory of God, this is how you do it. You, you want to bring a reproach on the gospel, be the one that shows partiality and favoritism. So... Uh, let's, let's go through the respect of persons. What are we talking about? That would define as partiality, favoritism. Now watch this. Specifically, specifically, favoritism with the rich over the poor. I can't just make this sermon about partiality because it's not just about partiality. It's partiality about the rich over the poor. That's what it's talking about. You're preferring someone, Miss Laura, because of their financial wealth or their prestige or their power or something that they can give you over someone that is destitute of wealth. So this is what the command is. Don't do that. 
That is a sin and that is wrong. I remember I was in the car with a local pastor here that I'll even mention, but we were coming back and I worked at Treasure World for uh, too many years, 15, 16 years, and uh, let Daddy say amen in the back there. But uh, it, anyway, I saw a lot of people that were different. And what I mean by that is I saw a lot of poor people. I saw a lot of people that didn't smell good when they come in. And what, I had, what God taught me through that was, hey, look, Miss Laura, there, there, there were men that come in that brought $10,000 guns into that place. The most expensive scope that I ever sold was about a $9,000 Trigicon. We dealt with people that had a little money, and we dealt with people that was destitute of riches. And what God taught me through that is how not to show partiality for the rich over the poor. It's vitally important that we don't do that as an individual, and especially as a church. Um, if there's something that I can pride our church in, and let's leave the word pride out of it, or glory in our church in, is this right here, that we're concerned for everybody's needs. No matter who you are, where you come from, if you're a member, you're not a member, we're concerned about you. And I think that is an open testimony that our church has. And I praise the Lord for that. When I call the men of this church, and they say, there's a need here, they don't even ask. I mean, y'all don't even know who Miss Shiflet is. We bought her a car. I mean, uh, praise the Lord. And we, we're, all, we're all concerned. So I, I commend our church for this. But what's the co contrast here? There is a way that the world sees people, Brother Roby. This is the way the world sees people. And did so in that day. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. But the rich is defined as the one that are wealthy, abounding in material resources. It was a, um, a, a gold ring. That's why I mentioned that. Um, the Bible says if there's come one in your assembly that has a gold ring and you show partiality to him and you say to the poor, sit there under my foot, footstool. A gold ring in that day was a sign of wealth. And how many of us know some wealthy people in here that wear gold necklaces and wear big gold rings? There was an individual that uh, we flew to Myrtle Beach with and uh, this is not to say nothing negative about this man by, in the least bit. He's a good man. Uh, but he wore a big old wedding ring. And it had a big old cowboy, uh, what, what do you call it, a horseshoe? Had a big horseshoe on top of his ring. Big old gold thing, big gold necklaces and all. And what was that sign of? Sign of that he had money. Sign of his wealth. And oftentimes, in this culture especially, Miss Laura, do you know that in this culture, that you could actually go to a place and rent a ring for a party? You could go rent one. Why? Because you want to look like Big Bank Hank, right? And you, you, you come in there at a party and like, you come in there like this. You know, I'm somebody. Six more payments and this baby will be mine. You know? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just you, you, you rent that gold ring and it just, it, you know, you, you was one of prestige and power. That's what the ideal is here. They come a political official in our auditorium and we show more respect to that political official than we do some guy from the hood over here. We're out of line. Why? Because we become judges of evil thoughts. That is fleshly. That is worldly. And that is flat evil. Amen. I remember I invited a couple. And I'll say that. It wasn't a couple. It was actually a wife and a daughter to a, uh, to a service at a certain church that I went to. And they come in the building. Nobody spoke to them. Nobody. Finally got them there. Service was over. They heard the gospel. But watch what? Watch what? Watch this. This is what the church has got to get through our heads. They heard the gospel. That's one thing. But then they watched the way the people behaved. See, there's five gospels, Daddy. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. And 90% of the time, they ain't going to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they're going to read me and you. And here's what that lady seen. Nobody talked to them. We had a, a, a little a, a lunch event afterwards, and they went over there, and not one person, they sat by their self. And they left. You know, I never know that talk to them again. But I don't have to think or wonder what they thought about that place. I know what they thought about it. Rightfully so. That was sin. That's sin. You want to quench the Holy Spirit? Let's behave that way. Show impartiality. Because they don't, they don't meet a certain status quo. You can see this in prejudice and racism. You can see it 
uh, in, in financial wealth. But this is the way that the world sees things. How many of us know people that have money? They don't really care to hang out with people that don't. Matter of fact, they kind of look over them like they're smaller than they are. You know why? Because a lot of rich people are prideful. In the Bible, in the Word of God, and I'm going away from my notes and it's okay. In the Bible, in the Word of God, you see many passages talking about the rich man. It's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. I mean, if you know what a, 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 the end of a needle looks like in a thread. I mean, could you imagine stuffing the Wednesday hump day camel through the eye of the needle? It's about near impossible. But thank the Lord, the Bible says, with God, it's an, uh, with God all things are possible. That's the only way any of us can go through the eye of a needle. But uh, what, what I'm saying is that the rich in the Scripture, it's not wrong to have money at all. It's not wrong to be rich. But at the same time, it's not wrong to be poor. Some prosperity gospels say God wants to make you rich. Not so. Do you know that in Ezekiel's day when God called Ezekiel to his ministry, they lost his family? He didn't have nothing. He was lonely. But God called him to it. Hosea had to marry a harlot. I mean, God stripped him of his pride. Stripped, stripped him of his dignity to serve the Lord. But serving the Lord should be done. and the, uh, uh, Living a life according to the gospel must be done without partiality. Without preferring the rich over the poor. And you shouldn't have a problem with a rich man neither. Just because he's rich doesn't make him evil. Money's neutral. It's the individual that has the sin. Money's neutral. But it's the individual. So we see the audience. We see the command. And the act is showing favoritism. Uh, the, the analogy give here in the scripture is uh, the action of it. It says, sit here in a good place or stand there under my footstool. An evil thought. Treating people with wealth differently than poor people. Now this needs to be said. This needs to be said. Respect. Watch this. Respect is not given. Let me say that to a culture that thinks otherwise. Respect is earned. People think they deserve something. But they behave in a way that's so contrary to that. You know, spiritually speaking... What brings respect is faithfulness, it's godliness, it's holiness, not financial gain. Not financial gain or wealth. Some people are treated differently if they tithe well and have certain benefits over the poor or get special treatment. These things must not be at the church of, our Jesus, of Jesus Christ. This is a reproach on his glorious Name. If you remember the rich man and Lazarus, you know where the rich man ended up. And you know where Lazarus ended up. Why? Because Lazarus was poor? No, but he was poor in spirit. Well, in the scripture, listen to the word of God. Listen to me, church. You know when Jesus said, be holy as I am holy? We sing that old song, Miss Kim. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. Remember that song? Listen to what his path is. Listen to the example he sets. Acts 10, 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. You know what that means? You can't buy God's favor. Amen. Our wealth, our prestige, what we own, what we possess, does not impress God. And it should not impress you and I neither. Now is there something to be said about a man that can handle his money well? Yes. It is. That's honorable. Is there something to be said about a man that works hard for it? Yes. Is there something to be said for a man that owns a company and provides for multiple people in households because the good stewardship of his money? Oh, yes. Yes. It's not wrong to have money and to be wealthy. But we need to serve the Lord as God has propered up, prospered us. And listen to me, whether you make $100,000 a year, whether you make $25,000 uh, $25, a year, God gives to us according to His own grace. God gives wealth and He distributes it in the way that He sees fit. If you don't have a money, it might mean that you can't handle it. 
That's why the Lord ain't giving me a bunch of money, because he knew I'd have 65 lasers. Amen? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just joking there. But I am saying that um, there is virtue in stewardship of finances. Don't, don't, don't mistake me there. God's example is he shows no respect for persons. Romans 2.11, for there is no respect of persons with God. Deuteronomy 10.17, for the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great God, the mighty, a terrible, which regardeth not persons. Amen. Uh, Ephesians 6, 9, give you one more. And ye masters do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also in heaven, neither is there a respecter of persons with him. The example is given. The work of the rich. Oftentimes, I'm not going to spend no time on this. Oftentimes in this culture, rich would oppress in this fashion. They would, um, they would go in and they would uh, sue them for maybe a, a, a something that they had borrowed of the, borrowed of the rich, whether, whatever, and the rich would oppress the people. And I could go a little further into it, but I'm not going to because I don't think it's necessary. Uh, in the scripture, um, oftentimes the rich is referred to in a negative sense because it's hard to get a rich man to see his need for anything. I mean, you ever talk to a rich guy? I mean, it's like this right here. They don't need anything. They got it all handled. They got it all figured out. Why? Because their trust is in money, not in the living God. And that's idolatry. Amen. And, uh, it, you know, they, they, they think highly of their self. They think highly, more highly than they ought to think. They need to go back and read Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. They're Listen, I'm a beggar apart from Jesus. And I ain't, got, I ain't got a problem with saying it. I'm a beggar. Like Chris said, I'm a failure without him. My righteousness is as filthy rags. You've got to come to Christ broken. You've got to come to Christ honest. You don't come to him with your finances. You don't come to him with your prestige. Your prestige stinks compared to his glory and to what his law demands. Oh, we need a Savior. Like Jesus said, no bucko, you must be born again. I don't care if you are um, Nicodemus the Pharisee and you got prestige and power and influence. Now You better come poor or don't come at all. You'll come like the rich man did, the rich young ruler. He walked away with his head Saw head down because he had many riches. Remember that? He chose his riches over Christ. So the law is this. Thou shalt not avenge. Uh, Leviticus 18, 19, 18. In verse 8 it says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. No need to spend a lot of time there other than this. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have I loved you. How is it that you're loving the poor when you're showing partiality? Or watch this. How is it are you loving the rich when you're showing partiality to the poor? It's easy to have a soft heart for people in need. But do you know that the rich man that has a brazen heart is in just much need as the poor man with a brazen heart? They're on the same... Listen, <laughs> when you go under God's playing field, it's level. You put that level on God's playing field, it ain't black and white, it ain't man and woman, it ain't rich and poor, it's all level at the foot of the cross. They ain't no good and they ain't no... They're all bad. They ain't no good and they're no righteous. They're all... Falling short of the glory of God. The law is to love one another. Romans uh, 5, 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good for edification. Do you know what is supernatural? Church, listen to me. Do you know what's supernatural? It's not supernatural to love people that love me. It's easy to love members of this church. I mean, when Roby calls me and says, Preacher, I'm praying for you. It's easy to love Roby. It's easy to love Ronnie when he's encouragement to me. It's easy to love Richard when, you know, he gets me a gift. It's easy to love them. What's supernatural is to love the ones that don't love you. It's to love the ones that despitefully use you and always talk about you behind your back. That's what's supernatural, church. In your life, you know, what, you know how you can be salt and light? Talk to the ones that don't talk to you. You know how you can be salt and light and make a difference? Don't show partiality. Amen. Amen. That's what the Word says. Amen. Boy, I tell you what, I, the Lord stepped all over my toes this week. <laughs> so I'm just returning the favor here. I don't, think we have, I don't think we have this here. But at the same time, preventative maintenance ain't never a bad problem. But if the Lord's speaking to you about it, by George, you, you let Him speak to you about it. Amen? Amen? So we see the caution. We see the consideration. And the last, and I'll leave you alone, is the conclusion. 
Here's what this does in verses 9 through 13. But if you have respect of persons, what does the Bible say? Ye commit sin. If you have respect of persons, ye are committing sin. This is wrong. This is a trespass. This is walking outside of the will of God. This is a revealed will. It's not, soupy, uh, it's not spooky. It's not super, it is supernatural. It's not spooky and it's not mystical. It's revealed here. Don't show partiality. You know the ones that, let's just say if you have somebody, and I'm going to go out on a different limb here real quick. If you have somebody that is not necessarily, they don't think the way that you do, why don't you start praying for that individual? If, if you don't maybe see eye to eye about something, why don't you just pray for them and maybe invite them for dinner? Do something kind for them. You know, like Jesus did for you when you didn't deserve it. You know, like when Jesus listened to you when you didn't deserve it. You know, like when Jesus was willing to forgive you when you, wouldn't, you, know, when you didn't deserve it. You know when Jesus showed you mercy. You know what mercy is? Not giving you what you deserve. It's withholding something. I know he deserves it, but because of what Jesus did to me, I'm going to behave this way to somebody else. See, this is what faith is all about. It's easy, right? No. Why? Because we've got a flesh that's still alive. He's alive. Amen? But you know, like Paul said, I have to die daily. Let me tell you something. If you're going to live this Christian life successful, you're going to live it apart from that word. Let me tell you about something about uh, Hebrews chapter 5. The writer of Hebrews, which I don't know exactly who it was. I know it was inspired by the Holy Ghost. Let the church say amen. In Matthew 5, he says, You, you, ought, to be, you ought to be on the meat of the word, but you're on the milk of the word. And because people are on the milk of the word, ready for this? They made immature decisions. They lived like they were immature Christians. Why? Because of their relationship with the word of God. You want to... You want to be an immature Christian? You let that Bible gather dust on it at home. You've got no excuse not to read that word. You can have your iPad read it to you. Amen? Amen. You can have, you got YouTube. You got 45,000 sermons on uh, YouTube. Probably this Sunday. I'm just saying you got a plethora. Don't let it escape from you, church. I'm not being mean this evening. I want to help you. If you, your, your spiritual walk with God is directly related to your relationship to the Word of God. And let me tell you something. Sunday morning, Sunday night is not going to cut it in your life. It won't. We can come and be encouraged at church. And I, I, I do believe that there is a significant means of Christian growth that takes place inside of the preaching of the Word of God. But at the same time, most of our spirituality comes from us borrowing somebody else's spirituality that we heard on a podcast. And we're more parrots than we are authentic. You know where you get authentic? When you get into the Word. You know when God starts working on you and your self-control and we don't have to worry about public control? It's when you get in that Word of God yourself and you let God's Word work on you. That's right. There's the source. I can't change neither one of you. But I know who can. And I know the means in which He does it. And that's the Word of God. And let me tell you something. Uh, Tiana, when I get in front of the mirror, sometimes I need to be changed. And I think some of the most foolish statements that you and I can think to ourselves is that we're okay. There's things that God still needs to work on each one of us on. That's why we have meetings. That's why the Word of God is proclaimed. And we're praying that it will bring increase uh, in the body of Christ for His glory. We don't want to bring a reproach on His name. We, my iPad just died. Don't you love that? That's okay. I'm still going. But um, we don't want to bring a reproach on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have respect of persons, the Bible says you commit sins and convince the law as a transgressor. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet yeah, fit in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, I don't commit adultery. You know, we might pride ourselves as, hey, look, I don't do that. I remember Candace, and this is not to, uh, this is not to belittle what, what we're doing here, but Candace used to always tell people, you watch this certain movie, but don't watch it without on VidAngel. No, -uh, you can't, you got to watch it on VidAngel. You can watch it, just watch it on VidAngel because it, it has a bad scene in it or it says a bad word or whatever. You know, she, she made sure to tell everybody, you got to watch it on VidAngel. And she's right in that. You know, the Bible says evil communication corrupts good manners. Amen? Uh, you know, thine eye affects thy heart. Guard thy heart with all diligence. For out of the issues of life. We better guard it. Because it's bent the wrong way. I'm telling you right now. You can't handle it. 
Why? Because your flesh is more corrupt than you might think. The heart is deceitful above all, and who can know it? That's Bible. Not my opinion, church. I don't even know where I was going with that. But anyway, um, sounded good, didn't it? Everybody get bit angel. That's where I was going with that. Red, you got to get bit angel right now. <laughs> but uh, everybody get bit angel. But, uh, and I'm not sponsored by bit angel. <laughs> But uh, it says we're guilty if uh, we're committing this sin of showing partiality for the rich over the poor. We might pride ourselves, and this is where I was going with this, we might pride ourselves in what we don't do. Then we're not like other people. But I don't want to be like every other church in this town. With cliques and preferring one over another. Are we not all in the family of God together? Church, act like it. Grow up. We're going to spend heaven and eternity together. We better learn to get along down here. Amen. And ain't nothing going on. I'm just saying. Might want to take somebody out that you ain't took out yet. Might want to write them a card and tell them you think about them. I can't do it all by myself. And this church ain't going to grow with me going to take you all together not showing partiality amen if that's taking place it's a sin it's a reproach on God's name and it grieves the Holy Spirit of God in our church are you the link in the chain all it takes is one weak link I'll close with this the other day I was at the warehouse brother Richard and there was a I was pulling about 15,000 pounds out of the tongue of a trailer. And what I do, Brother Joe, I have a chain that is attached to the right side of my boom and the left side of my boom. And it runs, one chain runs across there. And I'll hook two chains to it. Well, the chain that was run across my broom, it had a weak link. I remember I'd run over it and I'd actually run over it with a casting and, and, and uh, like grinded it down. And that, leak, uh, that link was weak. And when I went to go pull all that weight out of the back of it. And church, you know that we're going forward and that this church is alive. You know that the church is a living, breathing organism. You know there's a real spirit and there's a real unity and there's real power here. And if you're that weak link, that forklift, Brother Richard, had plenty of power to pull all that weight out of the back of that truck. Plenty. But because the chain had a weak link, it was not able to operate in its full capacity. And the job was not able to get done. Church, is there a loss and dying word out here? I don't care if the stinking carpet's blue, purple, or green. Don't let little things become mountains here at our church. Amen? Why? Because we're all going out for the glory of God. We're all here for a purpose, and that's to serve Him. I ain't here for Joe. I love Joe, but I'm not here for him only. I'm here for God's glory, for what He's called me to do, and you ought to be here for the same reason. We're just pilgrims passing through. And let me tell you something. We don't think like the world thinks. Mm -mm. That's the problem. The problem is not living in a world. The problem is not when you put the boat in the water red. The problem's when the water gets in the boat. And that's the problem with the church. When the world gets in the church, and the carnality, and the depravity, and the ideology of the world gets inside the local church. That's what cripples the church. Amen? Amen. Right. I love y'all. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this sermon. I pray, Lord, that you'd take this sermon and use it in our hearts and our lives. And I pray, Father, that you would just help us to search our hearts, Lord, and to, to grow in grace and, Lord, to um, just minister to one another in a way that would be pleasing to you. And, Lord, I want to say this publicly. I'm thankful for the kindness that people have showed me here at this church. Overall, I've been shown much more kindness than I have grief. Lord, the people here are always willing to help the poor, to minister to the rich. 
And I pray that you'd bless them for that. Help us as individuals grow in our own life in this area. Lord, maybe you just need to make us aware of it. I know Father's helped me. And Lord, there's nothing wrong with having friends in the church. By no means. I hope we develop friendships at the church. I pray, Lord, you just help us in this manner. A way to be pleasing to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. You're dismissed. Be here for Sunday school, 10 a.m. And then uh, our revival will start that morning. Our meeting will start. We hope brings revival. You'll be praying for it. God bless you. You're dismissed.